Welcome to Science Systems and Applications Incorporated, also known by our acronym SSAI's fifth live podcast episode. I am your host, Jason Dietrich from the SSAI Communications Department. As we always say at SSAI, the future is grand with our engineers, scientists, technicians, and our educators. I just wanted to thank you all so much for listening in to our conversation today. Not to mention today is Friday, so TGIF, right? <laughs> if you are curious about what we've been up to, please make sure that you follow us on each of our social media platforms, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and our brand new YouTube channel. Please also check out our website. We have job openings in a variety of different fields. And if you are passionate about science, exploration, and humankind, SSAI is the place for you. All the links for each of our social media handles will be provided right down below in the description of this video. Please check each of these links out and don't forget to like, share, subscribe, comment, and engage with us via your questions about anything SSAI is currently working on. All our scientists, engineers, technicians, and educators are doing amazing work and contributing to many different initiatives that are occurring, like at NASA, among many others to help benefit humankind. Speaking of educators, we have two rock star guests joining me today. These are the same two guests we highlighted on our fourth live podcast episode. One of our guests is Holly Cole, who is the Globe Observer Coordinator. We also have Kristen Weaver joining us, who is the Deputy Project Coordinator for the GLOW program, and she is also the lead for Eclipse efforts and support for student research using Globe Observer. As promised, we are doing a follow-up conversation on the recent solar eclipse that happened this past Monday, April 8th, 2024. We hope that all of you got the chance to witness this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity and wonder. Thank you, Holly and Kristen, again so much for taking time out of your very busy schedule to talk with me again today. It is great to see you both again. How are you both doing? Great. Thank you. Awesome. Well, it's it's a great day at SSAI, right? <laughs> so the solar eclipse event that happened this past Monday, April 8th, is honestly something I will never forget. And I, I think you, Holly, Kristen, and many others across the United States and even around the world would strongly agree. It was a huge honor and privilege that I got the opportunity to witness this extraordinary wonder. For this episode, I would like to ask each of you some questions in relation to uh, the eclipse. One at a time, the first question I wanted to ask was, where were you during the solar eclipse, and what was the atmosphere like at that location? Uh, Holly, would you like to start us off? I'd be happy to. So I was in Kerrville, Texas. Kerrville is a little tiny town um, just north west of San Antonio, and um, they had an eclipse festival in their city park, which is along a river, and I should have looked up which river it is, but it was a beautiful river uh, with lots of trees and nice grassy park, and it was a, it was a big, big park. Um, they had a stage with music and um, food vendors and other kinds of vendors. And then on you know one side of the park and this side of the park, they had um, some science displays and activities that were a lot of fun. Um, and then a, the NASA um, booth was also there. That was one of the uh, places that NASA came and supported the event for. And the NASA exhibit was just really, really popular. It was always a very long line to get in to see all the NASA things. So people were really excited. So it was a very, um, very festive atmosphere. Um, we got there really early and, uh, it, you know, almost the first ones there and it just filled up and it was very crowded. And, um, but everybody was just happy to be there. That's fantastic, Holly. And, you know, I was just curious when you were talking about that event that you went to when you saw booths, there was like music and there were like other yeah. uh, crafts or events going on. I know down in Texas, uh, Bill Nye, the science guy, as we all know, uh, was also uh, hosting an event uh, somewhere okay. down in, in the Texas area. Did you see him by chance? No, I did not. I did see another similar um, science group. Um they seem to be an organization that that sends 
scientists to do demos and activities with kids at birthday parties. So instead of, you know, renting a clown or whatever for your party, you rent the scientist, <laughs> which was really fun. And, and they did some really uh, great demos and, and had some super fun hands-on activities there, which I appreciated since I brought my seven-year-old and, and that went over very, very well. So no Bill Nye, but we had that. And then, of course, we had the NASA astronaut and um, NASA scientists, um, NASA chief scientist Kate Calvin was there. So, you know, we didn't have Bill Nye, but we had the NASA scientists, which I'll take. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I, I, all of um, the, you know, NASA scientists or, you know, any STEM person in general is a rock star, uh, in my honest opinion. Holly, I was going to say thank you so much for sharing about uh, your solar eclipse experience. It sounded like it was uh, so much fun. Um, Kristen, I'm going to turn it over to you and ask you, where were you during the solar eclipse and what was the atmosphere like at your location? So for the eclipse day itself, I was actually with just at um, a relative's house my, my with my husband and my husband's cousin and her son, a teenage son, and a friend of the of the teenager. So two teenage boys and the, the, the few of us adults. So not in a big public setting. I had been doing uh, public events at Hot Springs, uh, Hot, with Hot Springs National Park, the, the four days leading up to the eclipse. So that was the festival atmosphere. There was a, a, a NASA folks, also some NOAA folks there, um, and they had an eclipse fest uh, as well as some other public events leading up. But on the day of the eclipse itself, I was just enjoying the beautiful deck up about an hour and a half north of Little Rock, Arkansas, Fairfield Bay, Arkansas, sort of the lake off in the distance, but up high on a hill and uh, just enjoying the deck and seeing a nice view of the of the sky and the eclipse from 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 just, you know, a cousin's house. So uh, very, very much more relaxed in a lot of ways than being in a public event. Still some excitement. Um, I mean, e even the teenagers got excited. So that was something, <laughs> but but not a not a big public event uh, on the day of the eclipse for me. Oh. That's fantastic. Well, that that's I'm thrilled to hear that uh, the teenagers that you were with also uh, got excited for this, because as we said on the previous podcast uh, episode, this is just such an extraordinary wonder and it gets people thinking, it gets people curious. And how old, uh, Kristen, were the two teenagers you were with? Um, I think almost 16, I think. So, um, my yes, my the the, the cousin-in-law, I think he turned 16 in a few months. So probably both 15, 15, 16 year olds. Um, oh, that's that's fantastic. Well, I'm, I'm so glad to hear that uh, you had a great experience. And again, whether those viewers who are listening or watching, if you are at a, a public uh, event uh, like Holly was with a lot of people or if you were at more of a private event or a smaller event uh, like Kristen was, then the fact that you got the opportunity to witness uh, the solar eclipse is just fascinating, regardless of where you were. Uh, so Holly and Kristen, thank you both so much uh, for sharing about uh, your solar eclipse uh, experience. And uh, just to share a little bit about uh, where I was, I actually traveled up uh, to Erie, Pennsylvania uh, to see the solar eclipse. And um, I actually went to uh, the Erie Zoo uh, because I was very interested in seeing how the animals would react uh, to the solar eclipse. And I know, Holly, you recommended looking into uh, NASA soundscapes as being an eclipse observer. So mm -hmm. uh, I will be recording my observations in relation to that experience. And surprisingly, no animals uh, reacted to it uh, as it was going mm -hmm. on. Uh, it, it was very interesting. I think I was near um, some goats. I was near some chickens, and I was also near a jaguar, and the jaguar was talking, uh, but there was no overall reaction uh, when the sky went dark and, you know, when the temperature just dropped. So it, it was very interesting. It was such a great experience, so worth the trip, and I actually went to uh, visit my uh, grandmother's old house. She passed away almost 14 years ago, and, you know, when I got to see her house, I started crying a bit because I, I miss her, so... Uh, but, uh, but it was just an absolutely incredible experience and opportunity. And hopefully for those of you that were at the Erie Zoo as well, like myself, please definitely take the opportunity to record some of those observations. Uh, so, uh, that was just a little bit about, uh, my, uh, solar eclipse experience that I wanted to share with everyone. 
And Jason, and... It's, it's interesting that you didn't notice the animal changes. I wonder if it's because of the animals that were there, because I definitely heard, you know, some crickets or other insects come out um, and, and there were some changes in the bird sound. I think they, they dropped off and then, but the other thing that I, th there were lots of dogs barking. Uh, because mm -hmm. I think we were kind of up high on this hill, and so we could hear from uh, you know a, a lot of places nearby because of the elevation. And we actually heard quite a few dogs reacting to the darkness. So I think it just depended on what sort of animals uh, were around you and mm -hmm. whether they had a reaction to the to the changing light. Yeah, I wonder if the jaguar vocalization was a response to the dimming. Maybe it didn't change its totality, but um, the dim light, because I believe jaguars are nocturnal. And so maybe it was a little bit more active than normal. Uh, you know, if you'd gone on a normal day, it would just be, you know, dozing under the under something and <laughs> not not being quite as active. So but yeah, I don't really know. Yeah, we had I noticed a flock of uh, swallows were very confused and kind of flying together in, in circles very, very high up. Um, so it, that was the only change I noticed. Wow. Very nice. And what are swallows? I, I uh, never birds. Know. They're they're birds. They um these particular ones there was a big bridge over the river right there, um, a big cement bridge and they had built nests, those mud nests on the on the bridge itself. So, you know, they they lived there. Um, they'd been flying around kind of lower to the ground as normal earlier on. But as we got darker and right around totality, they started circling really high in the sky. And I've heard that report from other people as well uh, in other locations. <laughs> wow, that that's incredibly interesting. And uh, Kristen, I know since you brought up uh, the dogs, since you heard like a lot of dogs howling where uh, you were, uh, I remember one of our uh, SSAI employees uh, was encouraging us that if you have a pet at home to not, you know, let them outside while the eclipse was happening. And uh, my parents, uh, they live uh, in Pennsylvania, where I'm originally from, and they reported that uh, my Boston Terrier dog uh, got a little spooked before the eclipse. Uh, he did not bark or howl as far as I know. Uh, but then after the eclipse happened, then he settled down and was, you know, sound asleep on the couch. <laughs> so um, I, I a reaction, just a different reaction. Yep. Right. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and it probably it's... depends a little bit on the dog personality. That's true. Yeah. And, you know, there, there's so many different, you know, variables that you have to consider. And, you know, you both bring up a great point in terms of, you know, what the animals were, you know, what kind uh, were around you. Uh, so. You know, uh, Holly, since you mentioned that the jaguar might have been reacting or vocalizing to the eclipse, that very well could have been a possibility. I know mm -hmm. the jaguar was talking before the eclipse happened, uh, like a couple hours before. Very well. Then maybe have. it was just a very vocal jaguar. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not an expert on, on jaguar behavior, but I, I did wonder because I, I think they are nocturnal animals. Yeah, I think that's that's something I'll have to follow up, you know, with the Erie Zoo on. And perhaps when, yeah. some, you know, further data comes out, you know, we'll be able to see all of these cool observations. Uh, I'm just I'm so excited. I can't wait to see all this data come out. So I'm sure you, Holly and Kristen are, too. So well, the fun part is the Eclipse Soundscape project isn't over. Um, they now are looking for people to help them analyze the data. So listen to recordings and go through the reports and categorize things. So if that's something that folks are interested in learning more about and participating in, you can still go participate, even if you didn't get to experience the eclipse itself. That, so that's... check their website. It's the data analyst role yes. um, on eclipsesoundscapes.org. So that's still an opportunity to continue to contribute to this eclipse science going forward. That, that's absolutely fantastic. And for those of you viewers who are listening and uh, watching, please definitely take advantage of this data analyst role from what Holly and Kristen were sharing and uh, start to report and, you know, analyze some of the data because we definitely need your help. There's a lot of data points uh, and a lot of data observations out there. So please definitely, you know, contribute in some way um, to all the observations that have been taken. So a link for that will definitely be provided right down below in the video description of this video. So uh, please definitely check that out. And as a follow-up question, uh, Holly and uh, Kristen, I wanted to ask you both, 
What was the most awe-inspiring moment uh, you experienced uh, during the solar eclipse uh, based on where you were located? Uh, Kristen, would you mind uh, sharing your thoughts on that first? Well, and I have to say, so I was lucky that I was in a place that had four minutes and 14 seconds of totality. So I was pretty close to the center <laughs> line, and that, that was why I picked to be there. Um, and compared to 2017, when I'd been in Nebraska and it was cloudy and we just barely got to see the, the totality, this was, you know, we could see all the neat shadow thing, the, the, the crescent shadows and, and, and got to see and just standing there and uh, in there for, you know, over four minutes. It, it, I mean, it felt very short and very long at the same time. But I have to say, I love the eclipse itself. And that was a wonderful personal experience. But I also just really loved being there and talking to people and um, in the days leading up to the eclipse. And then also Tuesday evening after the eclipse, I got to go visit uh, the, the, the same, the, the, one of the, the cousin-in-law's other kids uh, is, a, is a, a lieutenant in the Civil Air Patrol. And so I got to visit her Civil Air Patrol cadet crew, um, and they had been collecting data for us on the day of the eclipse. And I got to visit them afterwards. And these, I mean, these young people were so enthusiastic and so excited um, and asking questions. Honestly, a lot of the questions they had were not so much about the globe, the globe data collection, but much more about the sun and how does that work and space weather and all sorts of things that, you know, I can answer a little bit, but not my area of expertise. But they were just so excited. And I had many interactions like that through over the, the, the course of the, the, the last week at these public events. So although the eclipse itself was was wonderful, I do love that people were so excited about this science event before and after. Yeah, I, that's that's absolutely uh, incredible, Kristen. And I 100 percent agree with you. The excitement was just incredible. I heard, you know, schools closed uh, or let out early uh, for this eclipse. And it was funny because I was as I was driving up to Erie, there was even a billboard sign. I remember driving and they were saying that. If you are driving on the turnpike uh, during the eclipse, please turn your headlights on and do not stop. You're not allowed to stop. You just have to keep going and, you know, turn your lights on. <laughs> so um, I think I think part of it is, too, that it was a point of commonality, that this is something that that all of us were experiencing together. And, you know, there's a the, that and I think that's. That's just really powerful. There's something, you know, I think there can be a lot of division in our society and different opinions on things. But for the most part, everyone was, even if they weren't excited as, about it as much as we were, they, it was still something that everybody could talk about. Um, and I think that's that collective feeling was was really amazing over the last, you know, few days before the eclipse. Oh, Absolutely, Kristen. I, I could not agree with you more about that, uh, because when I, you know, saw it amongst uh, the group of people at the Erie Zoo, there were applauses, there were cheering, and it was just so inspiring and motivating to see, you know, how excited people were. And it just, you know, brought a smile to my face, uh, because, you know, despite uh, some of the stress that people might be going through, you know, across the United States and even around the world, it, it just gave us a break. It just gave us, you know, a sense of pride and, you know, also hope as well, um, which is uh, absolutely, again, uh, once in a lifetime opportunity. So that was very well said. I appreciate you sharing that, Kristen. And wow, four minutes of uh, totality. That's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, Holly, I'm going to uh, turn it over uh, to you and ask you, what was the most awe-inspiring moment you experienced during the solar eclipse based on uh, where you were located? So it was very cloudy in Kerrville, very cloudy. Um, the one of the people next to me called it the peekaboo eclipse, and that was a very accurate description of what was going on. We'd see the sun come out every now and again, and you know, you'd glance up and see what stage of eclipse it was in. Um, but right as we were getting to totality, the um, the mid-level clouds and the low-level clouds kind of parted a little bit. And we still had the high cirrus clouds that were thick enough that when you put your eclipse glasses on, you couldn't see the sun. But when you took them off, you could actually see the sun through the clouds. And enough light was blocked that you could see it without your eyes hurting. So um, I, I hesitate to say this, but we watched the uh, the totality approach without glasses because we could. We could. And um, I think because of that, I saw things that I have never seen before. This was my fourth eclipse, but this was the first time that I saw 
you know, that, that transition to totality where you get that really spectacular diamond ring effect. It's the effect that you see in the, uh, in the image behind me here, behind Kristen as well. Um, you know, where you get just a little bit of glowing and then it just goes dark. And, um, I had never experienced that before because I'd always had my glasses on. I'd always been in places with clear skies. I'd always had those glasses on and I never took them off until the sun was fully eclipsed because that's the appropriate safety approach, right? Um, but in this case, I got to see it because of the clouds and that was absolutely spectacular. I'm um, seeing the clouds kind of move around. The eclipsed sun was pretty amazing as well. Um, and then, you know, we, we, we had a little over four minutes of totality, but we only had like 30 to 45 seconds where we actually saw it and then it clouded over again. But the interesting thing was because this sun was shadowed from above, um, we saw, I'd never seen the cloud layers so distinct like that because it wasn't backlit. We had those shadows where you could actually distinctly see the low clouds, the mid clouds, the high clouds. And that was really fascinating. So I, the seeing the clouds and how the clouds shifted in front of the sun and then getting to see that transition to totality with my naked eyes, um, which is something nobody should ever do normally. Um, it was really, really, truly spectacular. And I echo Kristen, it was really because it was this peekaboo eclipse or um, somebody else called it apocalyptic with all the clouds moving around and all that. <laughs> um, it, 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 people around me, it was, you know, would just start cheering and screaming like the, the second the sun became visible again. So you always knew when it was time to look back up. Um, and that, that was a fun energy to be around. Wow, that's that's absolutely incredible. And I love the name uh, Peekaboo Eclipse, you know, with uh, um, you know, sun coming out and then sun and the sun coming into the clouds. I, I would actually have to say, based on, you know, where I was in Erie, it was doing the same exact thing. Like it was saying peekaboo and then oh, it's going into hiding and everybody I remember as the sun came out, they were like, Oh my gosh, the sun came back out. Yay. And then <laughs> and then as soon as it goes back into the clouds, they're like Oh no! Well, like, where's the sun? It, it's gone back into hiding. So um, mm. that's uh, that was just um, something that you know I experienced uh, in relation, uh, you know, to the eclipse. And you know, with you know, my awe-inspiring moment was, you know, as I listened to the animals. You know, like I said, there wasn't a whole lot of reaction. And again, it depends on you know what kind of animals there were, but. Um, just because, you know, some of the animals might not react it, that doesn't mean that, you know, with the data, you can just scrap it. It, it It's still valuable data mm -hmm. uh, that needs to be reported on and communicated to the scientific community. So I am definitely going to do just that after I fill out the Eclipse Observer form. And, you know, like I said, with uh, my dog at my home in my uh, state of Pennsylvania, he, he thinks it's funny. He thinks he's tough, but then when something comes at him, you know, then he cowers in fear and just runs away. So, oh, but, um, but he was a little nervous beforehand, uh, but he stayed inside. And, you know, then afterwards he just, you know, fell asleep as if nothing really happened. So, uh, like I said, I'm very excited to see the further data reporting based on what other people saw with this eclipse. And, Ollie and Kristen, thank you both so much uh, for sharing your most awe-inspiring moments. And yeah. it's just, it's just absolutely incredible. We could talk about this probably for an hour or two if we wanted to. <laughs> so, and I wanted to ask you both um, this question in relation to the eclipse, just as a, a final follow-up. As an eclipse enthusiast, what advice would you give to someone witnessing their first total solar eclipse, such as uh, this one that happened earlier this week? Ollie, would you mind uh, sharing your thoughts first on that? Sure. Uh, don't be afraid of clouds. I mean, if I had been totally clouded out and didn't see anything, I would have been very sad and I would not be offering this advice. But the fact that, you know, I did see something through the clouds and um, it provided such a unique experience um i would i would have told my myself you know two days before the eclipse to stop worrying so much um, the other advice is um just sit back relax and enjoy the experience you know go look at the shadows but you know just 
just relax and enjoy. Um, I didn't take a lot of pictures this time, um, two or three. And I think that's just because we were trying to just take it in and, and experience it in, in full. Um, and then if you can get to totality, go to totality, you know, it's, it's worth the trip. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think that's a uh, wonderful advice, Holly. And you know, it's, it's definitely a good point. You just have to sit back and relax. And I know I was a little nervous too, uh, mm -hmm. before the eclipse, but part of it was weather because it was raining and it was cloudy. Uh, so, but you know, then when we saw the skies clear, I, I was able to, you know, settle down myself as well. So, uh, but that's awesome. Thank you so much uh, for sharing that, Holly. Uh, Kristen, I'm going to turn it over to you uh, as an eclipse uh, enthusiast. What advice would you give to someone witnessing their first total solar eclipse like this past week's one? Well, and I agree with Holly on all points. I mean, I was lucky that I had a place that had pretty clear skies. Um, I think I did. I think I was I think I was I was fussing a little bit with too much in the morning and not enjoying as much as I should have some of the partial phases. I was trying to 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 punch out uh, the the Globe Observer logo to make a to make up to project crescent moons, and I I wish I'd actually managed to do that ahead of time, so I wasn't feeling quite so stressed trying to get it done, but to, before we <laughs> to be able to get a picture before. But no, I think I think it is worth going to totality, but I think there are things you can experience in a partial eclipse, and that's neat too. But if you can get to totality, you can. And I think honestly, although it was a very relaxing place where I was observing this time. I think it's different being in a crowd. I think for my next eclipse, I think actually, I think I'm going to go back to trying to be in a, in, a, in a crowd with larger people because I do think that that collective experience is is very cool and not not knocking the people I was with. It was it was it was more relaxing than if I'd been working an event. But <laughs> I do think the, the the gasps of excitement uh, that you get when you're in a when you're in a big crowd uh, is 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 also worth seeking out. Oh. The other thing that occurs to me is um, you mentioning partial. It, don't rush off after, you know, yeah. there are still, you were only halfway through after totality. And so you can sit and still enjoy some of those shadow effects and the, the really fascinating things that happen during a partial eclipse. That's still worth doing. Uh, so yeah, don't, don't be in a rush. Just let the whole thing happen and stay in place. Yeah. Absolutely. Very well said. I, I could not uh, agree with you both uh, more than that uh, in terms of your wisdom and knowledge uh, in relation to someone witnessing their first total solar eclipse. Because what I did was, was after I took off my solar viewing glasses, uh, it took my eyes a minute to adjust. I can still see, <laughs> which is <laughs> great. So because uh, otherwise, it, if we couldn't see, there's no way we'd be able to do this podcast episode. But um, but I remember, you know, after taking off uh, the solar viewing glasses, I just stayed and I spoke with some of the other community members that were in, you know, the Erie, Pennsylvania area. I met some uh, great folks. I met a volunteer uh, father who worked at the Erie Zoo or who has for the last 14 years, shared some incredible data facts about the eclipse and some of the animals. And I met uh, his daughter as well. So just, you know, like Holly and Kristen said, everyone, just, you know, stay and enjoy the moment and, you know, stay after. Really get the opportunity to connect with others because, again, this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity uh, that you would not want to miss. So, And I'm actually I'm actually going to quibble with you a little bit there, Jason, because I think calling it a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, I mean, we had some recently, and there will be another one in, in 20 years, but there is also the opportunity for those who are lucky enough to get to travel – and there will be partial eclipses that it's solar eclipses do actually happen every 18 months to two years somewhere. So we may not get it in the exact places where we are, but but the truth is it doesn't have to be a once in a lifetime opportunity. Uh, it, it can be, and it's still very special. I'm not saying it is it special, but I think that that it is something that, that uh, we should remember that other people in other parts of the world will get to experience this as well uh, much yeah. sooner than 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 we will in the U.S. again. Um, and, you know, maybe some people, I mean, I don't know, I'm I'm I in, I'm I in Spain in 2026. So, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, that's a very good point, Kristen. And I'm so glad uh, that you brought that up. You know, if you've become like a solar eclipse chaser. Uh, please definitely, you know, take advantage of that opportunity to go on out uh, to Spain. In this case, like what Kristen said for 2026, yes, you have to hop on a plane. 
uh, and you do have to spend some money with it. But it's if you become an eclipse chaser, it's it's definitely worth it. So don't be afraid to start, you know, planning ahead and, you know, planning for your trip out there. Because I know the next one uh, that's going to be occurring back in the United States, it's not until 2044. Is that correct? Yes. Correct. Yeah. So again, just because, you know, in the United States, if you did not get the opportunity to see it this time around, that doesn't mean you can't see it at other parts around the world. There's lots of opportunities out there. Uh, and it's especially good to take note of it and, you know, to take advantage of it when you can. So um, but uh, this is absolutely incredible. Uh, Holly and Kristen, thank you both uh, so much uh, for sharing uh, your thoughts in relation uh, to your experience uh, with the total solar eclipse that happened earlier this week. We at SSAI, again, promote diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility access to make everyone feel welcome and make everyone's voices heard. And I am just incredibly grateful myself to be a member of SSAI. And I'm also grateful for the work uh, that you two, Holly and Kristen, are continuing to contribute to in order to expand the amount of impact SSAI makes on various STEM initiatives. So with that, Holly and Kristen, I just wanted to thank you both again so much uh, for joining me again today to talk about the exciting events that came after seeing the solar eclipse. You both, again, are truly rock star educators who are really making an impact and difference globally. And everybody is going to be very excited to see this continued STEM outreach and impact. At SSAI, we believe the best way to obtain knowledge is to pass it on. So again, for those of you who are curious about what SSAI has been up to, please make sure that you follow us on each of our social media platforms, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and our brand new YouTube channel. Please also check out our website so you can stay up to date on many missions and initiatives like the GLOBE program and even GLOBE Observer that SSAI supports. We have job openings in a variety of different fields, and if you are passionate about science, exploration, and humankind, SSAI is the place for you. In addition, if you want to learn more about the GLOBE program, please check out one of our links in the video description below in this video. Please also check out our fourth live podcast episode by also visiting one of our links provided below where you will get to see Holly and Kristen share additional feedback and activities that are currently going on with the GLOBE program and also about the eclipse uh, in general. Also, be sure to engage with us via social media with your questions and comments about this podcast. We want to hear from you. Your voice and ideas matter. Thank you to those of you who have subscribed to our YouTube channel and followed us on our social media already. Please continue to like, share, comment, and subscribe to each of our social media platforms to see all the global STEM initiatives SSAI is involved in. Please don't be afraid to comment and share with us on any eclipse photos you might have taken so that way then we can continue the great observational work and please don't forget like holly and kristen were saying if you are interested in the data analytics job that link will be also included in the description below because they are looking for people to collect the data but then to also record the observations but then also to organize it further so if you want to contribute in that way please do so Again, I am your host, Jason Dietrich, SSAI Communications Department member, and thank you all so much for joining. We hope that you have a wonderful rest of the day and a great weekend, and please be on the lookout for our next podcast episode. Until next time, everyone. Cheers.